Hi and welcome to episode 100 of the This Reportage podcast. My name is Alan Law, I'm the founder of This Reportage and The Reportage family and I'm a photographer too. Wow guys, yes, we've reached 100 and honestly I find that totally surreal, really surreal. It only feels like a few months ago we started but but wow, yeah, it was a couple of years ago that we put out those first few episodes and now it's, yeah, two years later we're on to podcast 100. It's amazing, honestly. It's so, so surreal. Um, I was looking back at some stats and we've had over 76,000 listens, which means that each episode gets listened to over 760 times on average, each episode, which I find mind-boggling. So I'm just so thankful that that you guys tune in and you get, you know, you listen to these these brilliant photographers that I talk to week in, week out. It's so awesome that they get this platform to be heard. Um, so thank you just so much for tuning in. Thank you for the kind messages that you send me, the shares that you do on Insta, the reviews you've left. Honestly, it just, it's it's awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really cool. Um, I thought I'd do a bit of a special episode for this 100th one. I think it's always good to celebrate milestones in life. And I thought, yeah, good to do something a bit different. So I thought I'd do a bit of a, a montage episode of some previous episodes. Now, this isn't a best of episode at all. You know, there's been so much amazing content over the you know, well, it's 100 episodes, this is 100, so the 99 episodes so far, I couldn't do an episode, a best of one, that'd be like, a, it'd have to be like a 10 plus hour episode. So these are just some clips or sound bites from things that, that stood out to me or things that I remember or things that just made me smile or things that gave a good kind of taster of the podcast. So if, you know, if you're a regular listener, I hope you'll enjoy kind of revisiting some of these uh, past episodes with me. Maybe it'll point you to some episodes that you missed. And if you're a brand new listener, hopefully it'll give you a good sense of, of what the podcast is about. Also, to celebrate this milestone, we're giving away 10 This Is Reportage or This Reportage family memberships. And if you're a winner, you can choose which site that membership is for. It's also open for existing members because I hate those promos that are just for new members. So if, if you're a winner, you'll get an extra 12 months added on to your membership. There are two chances of winning one of these 10 memberships. One of them is um, you need to listen to this episode and answer a question about it. And the other one is an Instagram contest to tag some photographer friends who you think might want to join us or who would love the podcast. Or you can find all the information by heading to thisreportage.com or thisreportagefamily.com and finding this podcast post there. Good luck if you're entering for that. And before we start this special um, montage episode, just a little reminder, it's a brand new uh, award year on the Shepardage and the Shepardage family. And you have the best chance of being in our top 100 photographers or top storytellers list, if, if that's your thing, if you, if you enter the first award collections of the year. So, yep, if you want to do that, the submission deadline is 23.59 GMT on 24th of January 2022. Oh yeah, and if you want to enter the contest to win one of the memberships, please note that the deadline for that is 23.59 on the 20th of January 2022. So if you're listening after that date, um, sorry, too late. Anyway, let's go on to this special episode. A moment, it's, a, it's not just one thing, it's a complete action. Mm. And the action has like the previous of the action and the, all the action evolving and doing. So let's say two people are getting, uh, are going to hug, okay? So they walk to each other or one person walks to the other and then the hug appears and they say something and then suddenly maybe they look to each other and they hug again and then they look to each other and then they go. So the whole moment, it's all this. Right. If I only take one picture and I'm just, uh, I take a snapshot of something that happened, but I don't know if that's the best snapshot I can take. Mm. So if I am there in the whole moment, so in my conference, I said there's a definition I love in the uh, Romans said a moment. It's what happens in one minute and 40 seconds. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you have to stay there one minute and 40 seconds. Sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes it's just 30 seconds. And, you know, but the thing is that if you stay from the beginning till the end and each picture that you do, it's just trying to get better than before one because First, you react and you do one picture and then you say, oh, my God, there's this a stick out of the head. Of, so what if I just switch a little bit to the left and then a little bit down and then, you know, and, and you work on it. 
mm-hmm. and you let the the moment uh, evolve in front of you and you take all these pictures then afterwards when everything is calm and you're in your computer you can see how this moment has different it's like a wave goes mm-hmm. up and down up and down and then you can be able to choose the highest peak the highest expression of that moment the inimitable rocio vega there from episode 19 talking about how moments are like waves personally i i love how the podcast can be deep and give such great advice about shooting and, and business and life and and rocio's advice there is, is just brilliant but i love as well how it can be full of just real really funny personal stories um such as this one from david skulls in episode 23 a bit of a mistaken identity moment. There's a, a wedding venue that I have uh, shot at a couple of times before, but when I um, when I got my, my pre-wedding questionnaire back, they, they were getting ready. The brides uh, and the bridesmaids were getting ready. They'd hired this lovely little cottage to get ready in. So uh, so I'd not been to this, this cottage before. It's 20 minutes away from the venue, popped it in the sat-nav, and... It's a bit in the middle of the countryside, but there's a couple of houses, and I and I, and I pulled into the driveway, and I was like, "Is this it? Is this it?" And then I saw in the front window a group of girls with all the dressing gowns on, and w- they were waving through the window at me. Ah, oh, so here we are. I'm here. So took a few uh, scene setting photos of the outside <laughs> of the building, and then uh, went with my camera bag, knocked on the front door, and this. Uh, lovely lady answered the door again in one of those kind of dressing gowns that they wear a bridal prep and uh and she invited me in and i assumed it was uh, uh the the bride's mother so i get taken in <laughs> i get taken into this room with all these uh, other girls and uh, hey how you doing everyone nice to meet you all hello hello i'm dave blah 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 um and then let them sort of carry on with their thing you know whatever they're doing and i started uh i, st- I put my camera bag down and I went, oh so where uh, it was amy the name of the bride uh, so where's amy Oh, she's just upstairs. Oh, cool, cool. Right, okay, well, she'll be down soon, I take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started getting my camera out of the bag, and uh, and they all were now looking a little bit confused. And uh, <laughs> and they said, sorry, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? I don't, I'm, I'm the photographer. I'm photographing Amy's wedding. So by coincidence, the person upstairs was also called Amy. No and they way. went, oh, no, we're, it's not a wedding. We're, not, we're a hen party. We thought you were the stripper. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's so funny. No, it's only nine o'clock in the morning as well. How wild was that hen party going to get? One of the things I love about the podcast is that the people I talk to are just so open and so honest and talk about things that I think we can all relate to. Um, there's an example here of two great family photographers uh, Lisa Hu Chen from episode 66 and Yulia Rose Grime from episode 60 talking about comparing yourself to others. You know I I would be lying if I said I didn't do that of course I look at other people's work and I'm like oh gosh but I think the difference is for me is that if I find myself comparing myself to somebody else um, you know first I'll kind of remind myself hey it doesn't matter but but then I'll just like look into that work and I'll be like well, why am I why am I comparing myself with this picture? And what about it is making me feel like I'm not, you know, good enough or or I don't feel like I'm good enough. And I and I kind of just see it as like again, like an opening to how I can um, you know, not so much improve myself, but expand on what I have. Don't hang too much time on social media and compare compare yourself with the others. That's so we true. all do shitty pictures. <laughs> We do indeed, yes. Ninety-nine point nine nine percent of mine are fit that bill. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> and we all have uh, sessions which should not win award. And on the subject of awards, a lot of my guests give great advice on their thoughts and tips about entering them, and some of them have been past judges themselves. So it's great to get their their insights. Um, too many to include on, on this special kind of montage episode. But some of my favorite tips come from the great Frank Boutonnet from episode 12. And he goes really into depth with three of his top tips for entering awards. Okay, so we could talk about this for hours. But <laughs> I would say like the, the first one is like kind of logical, but kind of study the kind of contest you are entering in. You know, I mean, like the contest have a kind of an identity as a contest, contest itself. You know, like, for example, this is a portage. 
for sure, when I'm editing a reportage for VC Reportage, I know I'm not going to put a post picture or something yeah. that's going to look posed because I know that is going to be disqualified. I know about it. So the idea is just to be clever and just to, to see the other contest results of this very same contest you want to enter. Mm -hmm. Try to analyze what's working, not working. Try to see if it fits your style or not, because not every style is fit for any contest. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. First, true. so first advice, just to try to analyze the, the market of contests. For me, it's a business thing. It's a market thing. So I try to analyze it with a professional eye and not with the ego eye. Okay. The second thing, I would say not for every contest, but the contest I love to enter. And for example, a fearless one, since you know that a lot of people are going to send a lot of pictures, I try to have what I call the, the, oh, the thumbnail effect. What I call this, the thumbnail effect is like, usually people who are going to go through all these pictures, they're not going to go through picture by picture. It's super hard. So usually you have like a mosaic of pictures on your screen mm -hmm. and your eye is going to be attracted by the more graphic pictures, mm -hmm. kind of the most simple to read. So when I'm applying to contest, usually my selection, I put the picture small on a, on, a, on a screen. I kind of step back. So it's impossible for me to see in details the pictures. But I try to see where my eye goes so that it's cat, the, my attention is catched, caught, sorry, by the most graphic and most attractive pictures on the screen. This is what I oh. call the thumbnail effect. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so second tip. The third tip I would give is like, I would divide my selection in three. One third of the selection I would send is really what I love, what I think is really me and I love it. Whatever people think about it, I don't give a shit. I think mm -hmm. I strongly believe it's my things. Like, so it's one third of the selection, it's something I really strongly believe, whatever people think about it, okay? That's cool, yeah. The second third would be, like strategically speaking, try to send pictures that you think fit in this, the spirit of the contest you sent. So by this, I just uh, come back to the first point of analyzing the contest and try to see oh, what kind of pictures, maybe, the, I'm not saying copying, okay? But the kind of pictures that usually fits in this contest. So it will be what, the second third of the whole selection. And the third third of the selection would be like, what I advise to do with people is like share with you your colleagues share with your friends, you know, but professional photographers you believe who are going to be hard on you if they think that your pictures are not good. Try to share a maximum of, uh, of picture with them and see which pictures people like the most. So this is just a statistic approach. And by mixing these three approaches together, I think you enhance the chances, statistically speaking, to hit the, to hit the goal. Some really great tips from Frank there. And we get lots of advice and tips on photography and business, but also advice on other subjects as well, such as this little clip from Rowena Meadows, um, our very first photographer of the year on the Reportage family. And she gives her tips on ordering a McDonald's. My favorite is a cheeseburger and I get um, chicken nuggets and put the chicken nuggets in the cheeseburger oh. and it's called, it's called a McGangbang. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you name did you name that or is it a known thing yeah i think it's a known thing and i think <laughs> a friend but oh name. my i, I love I that at McDonald's. once when i'd had a few drinks i did order a mcgangbang from and the girl at Marcus knew what it was so wow it's a known thing then that's so funny i've never <laughs> yeah. heard that <laughs> see if it's a known thing in your country and I'm sorry to say I haven't tried ordering a McGangbang yet. I really should, though. I love McDonald's. Oh, man, I, I loved Arena talking to her. I, I really do check out her episode. It's number 57. The funniest, well, one of the very funniest episodes that I've done. And she's just so warm and lovely and so insightful about so many things. Documentary family photography, but life as well. Really do, really do check it out. Um, another thing I just really enjoy about the podcast is finding out what people did before they became a photographer, getting this kind of insight into their past lives. And for instance, Adam Johnson, um, who was on our very first episode, used to be a football referee. It all took a sour turn, really. So refereeing is a very, thank well, as, as everybody knows, it's a very thankless task. And uh, you want, you know, I was, it was the end of one season, I was, I was refereeing some 
uh, important cup games and linesmen on other cup games and I, 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 somebody spat in my face and I just quit oh, refereeing quit refereeing that day and never never went back to it really but oh, I think some of it was because I was quite young so I was I was an easy target I think it could be something I would go back to oh man but that's that's an awful experience though as yeah well, I mean, well I, I would rather say I'd say it's character building <laughs> <laughs> that's never never happened at a wedding is it not when you've like delivered your photos and no. oh yeah uh, what are you trying to say no, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, i think it, it stuff like that definitely gives you a definitely toughens you up i was i was probably a bit of a wimp before i was a referee um i'm mean, still a wimp now but um it, it's definitely character building and it definitely helped me with uh the people side of things yeah i bet um, and just going in cold and deal, trying to deal with people and and try and and especially in difficult situations and and try and you know the the one of the key things to refereeing is to make everyone feel like you're everybody's mate, whatever team they're on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I think I still take that into weddings now. I still go into weddings, uh, and my instant goal really is to is to make everybody feel like I'm they're my friend and I'm their friend. Alison Bounce from episode twenty nine did something very different. I've been a firefighter for 10 years before to really? become a photographer. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's that's amazing. That's quite a change from firefighter to photographer. Yeah, totally different. <laughs> <laughs> so I start, I start um, a specific school when I was 13. Um, it's, uh, I don't know the equivalent in Europe, but in France, it's a young firefighter. So... Um, okay. You are following some course, main course, um, in plus of your regular courses, uh, school oh. courses. Um, wow. From 13, yeah. yeah. From 13 to 16. Wow. wow and okay. then you are volunteer. So you are fighter, firefighter volunteer for two years. Um, and then you can get, get, you can be a professional uh, when, you are, um, when you are 18. Yeah. Right, okay. So this wow. is what I did and um wow I'm... i mean it's so i mean because i think <laughs> wet, shooting weddings is a bit nerve-wracking but actually firefighting must be a, a lot more nerve-wracking no were you were you not afraid to do that oh no i was super excited um <laughs> it all the time yeah in france firefighter it's not just about fire so um, you can be like um uh, you can be called for emergency, like uh, ambulances, uh, or fire, um, sometimes for fluidy, or Yeah, so it's very, very different. So all of the interventions are so, so, so excited. So, yeah, I think wow. I love uh, adrenaline. <laughs> Mick Shah from episode 33 used to be a drummer. So basically, uh, back then, um, there was a church. It was one of the biggest in Europe. 10,000 people, part of this yeah. church. So I, they, were, they were looking for a full-time drummer. And I was part of the church, and I applied, and I got it. And so we were then doing concerts and things like Royal Albert Hall, Wembley Arena. Wow, and, cool. Yeah, so I, I said to people, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll without sex and drugs. <laughs> oh, so. <laughs> the fab Sitlali Rico, who you can hear in episode three, sometimes used to say she was unemployed rather than admitting she was a wedding photographer. Uh, now I'm very proud of it. But the first year when people would ask me, what do you do? I, I'd rather say I had I have no job than saying that I was a wedding photographer. I'd rather say unemployed. That's so funny. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Every single time I'm like, no, I'm no, no, nothing yet. <laughs> was there a certain point where that kind of changed for you and that you, you know, you were happy to tell people that you, you were a wedding photographer? When, when I started changing my photography, like when I realized that there were other things to be done besides just doing the checklist and just the bride um, and the groom kissing and then putting the rings on. And right. when I realized that there was like a whole industry out there doing amazing stuff. And that's when I when I saw that, I'm like, OK, this is what I want to do. And then I, I also realized that it's a very challenging. There's a, um, being a wedding photographer requires a lot of skills. Oh yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing. It's always fascinating to hear how people work. And here we have Ninka Kudike from episode 64 and Katrin Kuhlenberg from episode 56 
talking about day in the life sessions and how they approach their family work. There's a different pace throughout the day. So we have slower times. You have you have uh, you have times where you work in work a little bit less. You have times where you run around. You know what I mean? It's just like you f- you follow the pace of the ca- of the day. But also, what is really um, what never ever makes it boring, for example. If you have only one child in a in a in a family, you have like two parents and one child. You're not only photographing the child's life. You know what I mean? You're also photographing the parents' life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, what I will do, for example, with my latest uh, twelve-hour uh, day in the life, the mom is playing the piano. You know, which is great, of course. So I'm photographing that she's really into music. But then the doorbell rings and uh, friends of the son are coming in. Do you want to play outside? I'm like, okay, so I have to, okay, so let's do the mom first, you know, and then I put on my shoes and I go after the kids, you know, but dad at the same time is making pizza, like the pizza dough for the evening. And that's also a story. So it's like, there is like an endless stream of stories when you already have only three people at the same time. To me, what is important to to make my images different from the ones they will take is that I try to to put myself in the in the images. I mean that I try to find an angle they might not see or, or um, yeah work with light, something they don't see in the moment, but um, find very interesting when they see the images because they haven't seen themselves in this in this way. Mm-hmm. That's I'm not cool. so much a detail photographer. I mean, I know a lot of photographers who, who go in for details, a lot of hands or smiles or just hair. So, yeah, that's not me. I, I really, for me, sometimes it's more important to, to see everything. And um, I, I don't like bouquet. So because I always want to have a lot of context. So oh, okay. that in, when they go back after, it, I don't know, after lo- some years, it's... It's not just the prettiness of the image, but I want them to see where they lived and, and who was in the background. And it's not just to have someone blurry in the background and you can't tell is it grandma or is it mom? Or yeah, so yeah. yeah, I want them to see it and see, oh my God, mom, I mean, what were you wearing? And um, what were the phones you used at that time and everything. So I think to, to be a memory, an eternal memory, um, you should, really think about the uh, context of everything. One of the subjects that comes up a lot is nerves. And I guess that's my fault because I'm the one asking the questions. But yeah, I do find it really interesting. Um, If you've listened to the podcast before, you would have heard me talk about it a fair bit because I do get nervous. You know, I still do after so many years of shooting. um, I still do get it. But hopefully um, from listening, it's, it's, it's helped you know that so many photographers all around the world suffer from it too. You know, it's helped me from talking to these people. Uh, for example, the fab Philip Swiggers from episode 11 is talking about nerves here. Uh, I still get nervous on, on every wedding. Um, not, not when I start shooting, but, you know, like the road to the wedding. Once I start my, sh- uh, my, my photography, it's, it's fine. But I think before um, I get into the room, um, I'm always nervous. I'm, d- I'm doing this for like 12 years right now, and right. I'm still a little bit nervous for every wedding. So um, I um, totally relate to that. I'm still nervous. I still, on the way to every wedding, I always have to stop and have a little nervous wee. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't st- I don't stop, but I'm, I'm nervous. And then just when the door opens and, and the dad, mostly the dad of the bride opens the door and, uh, and it's, it's gone, you know, but yeah. it's just the road there. <laughs> as well as people sharing their experiences of nerves, we've also had some great advice on how you can overcome them. Here's Ross Harvey from episode two talking about that. Obviously, I do get hit with um, adrenaline and excitement or nervousness, but it's just a, it's an energy, isn't it? You can either make it fear or you can make it excitement you just change that energy to be one of the two and of course i'm not some sort of buddha that floats around i have my own fears and issues and i might get hit with a little in instant burst of uh oh this is going to be tricky but i don't generate that i don't perpetuate that as fear and my lack of ability i just turn it into i can do this so 
I have the skills to do this. I can get on with it. So you have to be very confident in the way you speak to yourself. Like your inner voice, most people don't realize is a reflection of your belief system. That's a massive, massive thing to know because it just reflects back to you how you think. So if you listen to your inner voice, you can hear the sides that are saying you can do things and you can hear the side of you that says you can't do things and listen specifically to the bits that hold you back. And then can, you can delve a lot deeper into how to do that. I mean, it'd take, diff, it'd take like a two-hour podcast to, to break that <laughs> yeah. down. But it just helps you analyze your, yourself. And that links back to the happiness thing, because once you start doing that, you're a lot happier. And I think what Dominic Shaw of York Place Studios says here from episode 26 just really, really makes sense. I don't get nervous because um, I know I'm going to just shoot how I see the world. And I, I can't change how I'm going to see the world. If I used to get quite nervous because I was like you know, oh, I, I can't do photographs like X photographer, you know, I'm, mm. but now I'm like, no, no, I'm just going to shoot how I shoot, which is the same as Liam, which is really advantage, <laughs> advantageous <laughs> and do that kind of style and that they love it and we love it. And it just makes you feel not nervous. It makes you feel comfortable and, and, and eager. I also had the pleasure of interviewing Liam Shaw of York Place Studios back in episode 55. And yes, I did have to start with this question. The main thing that I think everyone would love to know. Um, yeah. How did you meet Dominique? How long have you two been married? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so something that crops up all the time. Of course, we are siblings. Yes. <laughs> People yeah. must, because I remember first, you know, hearing of you guys. I, I, I think maybe a lot of people presume your husband and wife. Do you think, do you get that asked then? Uh, yeah, all the time. Even when, because um, Dominic's husband is um, a videographer and he, he works with us on a regular basis. So even because we're the photographers at a wedding, the, the, sometimes they say, like, oh, you're the couple. I'm like, no, no. It's, you know, don't we look a little bit alike? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. Something that we do pretty often is asking people how they captured some of their certain awards. And I find that just really interesting to hear yeah, how they got the shot, their thoughts behind it. Really, really interesting. I think we can learn a lot from it. Um, yeah, I know this is an audio format, but you can always go to thisreportage.com or thisreportagefamily.com to see the specific images that they're talking about as well. Um, here's Gretchen Yost from episode 78 talking about one of her specific Reportage Family Awards. These are, so two of my ki my two kids, and then the rest are friends, um, but they're all different ages. So they range in age from six to 13. Okay. And they were at this irrigate, there's this bridge on a bike path over an irrigation ditch. And they were throwing sticks over the bridge on one side, and then they would each throw a stick in at the same time, and they would run to the other side to see whose stick won. Oh, cool! And we call that we call that poo sticks in Britain. Oh, you have a of course you have a name for it. I don't think we have a name for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, poo, poo sticks. I don't know why it's called poo sticks. Or maybe that's just what we call it. I don't know. But yeah. Oh, that's funny. Sorry. Anyway, go on. Yeah, go on. Oh no, I love that. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to Google that because if we have a name, but that's what I should have titled the photo if we have a name <laughs> that I knew of in, in, in American English. <laughs> oh, that's funny. P maybe other British people listening to this now probably go, "What? How? What are you talking about? We don't call it that." But that's what we call it. Our family call it that. <laughs> anyway so yeah um but i just i loved it because i felt like no matter where you are in the world if you're a kid and you have any form of moving water even if it's water um in a you know a, a drainage ditch on the side of the street if you have any form of moving water and anything that will float in it if it's a leaf or a piece of trash mm -hmm. I feel like kids around the globe do this exact thing. So and I, weird. and I was trying and I, I did a lot of, um, still photos, you know, so photos that did not show the movement, mm -hmm. uh, just with a regular shutter speed and not a slow shutter. Yeah. And then, uh, and that just wasn't, and they just kept doing this over and over and over again. <laughs> So I, I had a lot that's of handy. That's handy when they, yeah, that's yeah. really handy when they're doing that, isn't it? That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had a lot of opportunity to figure out how best to capture this uh, phenomenon. By the way, I did kind of doubt myself after listening to this episode back, um, thinking, is it really poo sticks? Is that a proper phrase? But yeah, I Googled it and apparently it's from Winnie the Pooh. So that's why it's called poo sticks. So yeah, there you go. You learn 
Lots of different things on the podcast. Um, here's another fab photographer, the, the great Sam Docker, talking about one of his specific reportage awards, a really high up, top down shot of the bride getting into the wedding car. Have I got the confidence to say to Abby, I'm not going to follow you down the stairs. I'm going to stay up here. Because mm, it's a risk, isn't it? It's a oh, risk. Oh, massive risk. Yeah. 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 And like 99 times out of 100, I would have just followed Abigail down the stairs, documented her getting in the car from her, you know, from the street. But I didn't. I just, something told me to stay up there and hang my camera out the window, <laughs> fire off like a dozen frames as she's crossing the pavement and then leg it down the stairs. And oh, that was cool. it, you know, and That's sometimes so getting cool. that different perspective is, you know, that they're, they're the standout images, aren't they? Sometimes when you, you, Definitely. you document something from a slightly different angle that people haven't seen before. And just like when we do this on a normal episode, you can head to thisisreportage.com or thisreportagefamily.com to see the two awards that Gretchen and Sam spoke about there. As well as asking loads of questions about photography, I also ask lots of questions about life. Because for me, you know, it's just as important, if not more important, really, to be hearing about the people behind the camera. You know, that's why I started the podcast, was to hear about the people, not just photography. So, yeah, sometimes my questions can be uh, a little on the bizarre side, such as this question where I ask which day, if someone could choose, which day would they choose to relive over and over again? Here's Tyler Workin from episode 27 answering that one. Jeez. <laughs> It's like the worst question I've ever been asked. I don't the, even best know question, the best question. The best question. I've never. I don't even know. I don't even know. Um, I tell you what, though. This kind of goes back to the wedding photography thing where everybody says it's the best day of your life. Right? Um, weddings are. Um, it would not be my wedding day. There's, would it not? Sure. No, absolutely not. I tell my clients that. I say, this is, the, this is not the best day of your life. And I tell them, I go, I hope it's not. I go, because if it is, then I feel really sorry for you because there's uh, nothing left for you after this. Like, it's all downhill, right? That's so it's, true, isn't it? Yeah. It's an important day, but it's not the most, it, it's not the best day of your life. And here's our 2021, this reportage photographer of the year, Valter Antunas, tackling the same question from episode 21. I'm not going to say my kid's getting born because, you know, that's too cliche again. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I wouldn't choose a day. I would choose, like... You know, go back and uh, to when I was a kid. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you know, I, I really miss being a kid. You know, I'm that that guy who doesn't like getting old. <laughs> it, it scares me a bit getting old. And uh, you know, it's just uh, when when we think about you know when we were kids, it's just such a good time. Something that I really enjoy about the podcast is that I never know where the conversation is going to lead. Um, you know, I, I research into my guests, of course, and I, I have some questions for them. But it's great that it just goes into a free-flowing conversation. And uh, yeah, I never know what I'm going to be saying or hearing. Uh, as an example, here's the fab Else Corsten on episode 48, answering a question that I never thought I would have been uttering. What tips in general for being around cows? I know there's quite a specific question, but as I say, I'm quite, I, I'm quite nervous of cows. They're such huge kind of powerful animals. Um, yeah. What are tips for being around cows? I'm sorry. That's a very strange question, isn't it? But That's <laughs> fine. Yeah, be be uh, quiet, I think, because when they are really curious, so they want to come to you, but right. when you are making a lot of noise or uh, screaming or running, they are scared of you. So I think they are more scared of you, but they are curious, so they will always come to you. So I think when you are a quiet person, that it always be fine with cows. The fab Else Corsten there, who's a brilliant wedding and family photographer and who also shoots lots of weddings and day in the life sessions on farms. So she knows a thing or two about cows. I do often or sometimes ask more sensible questions as well, though, such as this one that I pose to uh, this reportage photographer of the year for 2020, the fab Yves Sieppes, when I asked him what, in his opinion, makes a good wedding photographer. Empathy. <laughs> I think <laughs> the first word that comes to mind, it's something that I kind of missed, I think, in the past as well. Um, um, it's something that I've also learned from my from my from my dark period that's behind me now. It's it's something that I uh, that I learned to have as well. Um, but it's also I think empathy and being fully client focused, you know. Right. And that's that links to what I 
you know, told you earlier about uh, disconnecting the ego from your photographer. Like, you know, in the end of the day, um, you know, you can be as creative as you want to be and win as many awards as you want to uh, that you can win and speak at conferences and travel around the whole world to shoot weddings. In the end of the day, you have a client that pays you for a service, you know, mm -hmm. and you're there to shoot their wedding and, you know, they choose you for a reason um, and you can have a great connection and that's all good. But in the end of the day, you know, you're there to shoot their story and not to fulfill your dreams and your aspirations and your, um, yeah, just to check your boxes, you know, you have to check theirs as well. And it has to be a mix of both, obviously, you know, um, but I think that's, um, I think that's a very important thing to be able to set your ego aside and, and just work for your client, even if you're tired, even if you're hungry, hangry, maybe, <laughs> know, um, just keep your client in, in, in mind and work, work, work. And on the subject of empathy, the fab Sophie Callowert had some really great things to say about it on episode 53. I find it interesting because there's this like, there's this fine line between um, humor and empathy. And I love, I love, I love humor and, and like little quirky moments in, um, in, in photography in general, in documentary photography. So like you're always trying to capture the weirdness and the, the little quirks. But then at the same time, you want to be very empathetic. And it's always, I find like you're always trying to find a balance between the two. You don't want to be, you don't ever want to make fun of people. You just want to like show them how much you appreciate their little, their little mannerisms, you know? That's so true. Yeah, that's something, again, I not really think about much, but that is true. You don't want to make fun of them. But yeah, highlighting what makes them unique, I guess, yeah, in, exactly. a, in a sympathetic <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah and, and that's that's another thing where like the uh, the conversation ahead of time with the couple is really important. Like the when you get to know each other, I'm always asking so many questions about um, what's your dad like? What's like a, a typical thing that your grandpa does? And what? Uh, tell me something specific and like quirky and and unique about your family because you want to be telling um, their specific story and you don't want your photos to just be like interchangeable, like mm -hmm. insert head, you know. The podcast is weekly and I alternate each week with talking to a wedding photographer and a family photographer. And something that I really love about the podcast though is that. The things that these people say, these great photographers, the advice, the stories, in most cases, what they say is really universal. You know, it doesn't matter if you're only shooting weddings or if you're only shooting families. The things that these people are saying really applies to both. Um, they really do. And I think anybody can learn from any type of episode. So I really hope if you, if you do like the podcast, and <laughs> hopefully you do, that, that you're tuning in um, each week and, and listening to both types of episodes. Um, for example, here's the Fab Stefana Farrell from episode 83. And I asked her, uh, um, what can someone do to become better at the documentary side of family photography? But what she says here can also just as easily apply to getting better at wedding photography as well. I mean, it's really just picking up the camera and shooting more. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I realized, you know, I, I was missing. Like, you can't just pick it up for moments that you think are going to be good. Like you can't just pick it up because you're going somewhere and it would make sense to pick up the camera now, you know, challenge yourself to pick it up when there really isn't anything to shoot. Um, there, there are a lot of great little um, like photography practices that you can do, like where you challenge yourself, okay, you take 10 steps and with every step, you have to take one more photo from your vantage point, right? You can't mm -hmm. move any further, but it's got to be something different. Or you pick an object in the room and you have to take it from 10 different angles um, and, and, and tell a different story every single time that you change the angle, you know? Right. Um, right. Pretending that you only have a roll of 36 in your camera. So you're really limited as to what you can, sh you can shoot. So you can't mm -hmm. just like shoot through a moment, right? You have to be more thoughtful about uh, when yeah, you're pressing the sense. shutter. 
So as I mentioned in the podcast intro, this is our 100th episode and we are doing a contest to commemorate it. We're giving away 10 This Repertage or This Repertage family memberships. If you win, you can choose whether that's TIR or TIRF. And I don't like it when contests uh, or promotions are just for new members. You know, I, th I want all these things to, to be for existing members as well. So it's open for existing members. And if, if you're one of the winners, then you'll get an extra year of membership. So, yep, yeah, there are two ways that you can try and win one of these memberships that are worth £100 each. The first one is a little Instagram uh, contest uh, where you just need to tag three or more of your photographer friends who you think may be interested in, in joining us. If you go to our Instagram accounts, which is at this reportage or at this reportage family, and see this 100th podcast post, you'll see details on how to do that. But the other way... Uh, to win one of the memberships is to answer this question, which is only appearing in this episode. And um, it's based around the, the fact that one of the best things for me that I really personally love about the podcast is the stories, people's personal stories. I just love that. I just find it so interesting. And um, this story that um, the person is going to tell you in a second is just one of my favorites. So, yeah, so the, the question is, who tells a nightmare story about traveling back from a destination wedding? And the answer is this next speaker, and it's Dan Morris. So there's the answer for you. It's Dan Morris from episode 69, one of my favorite stories. Um, so yeah, that's the answer. Just head to thisreportage.com or thisreportagefamily.com. Find the 100th podcast post, which you'll see on the podcast page, and there'll be a little form there where you can put your answer in. So yeah, here's one of my favorite stories from the fab Dan Morris. The one I did in um, Spain once in Marbella, um, I stupidly took a wedding the next day in Wales. Like back in Wales, really? Wow! Gosh. This is the and I was flying from Bristol, this, and I was living in Cheltenham. So this is the dull. This is the stupid me. Sometimes just says, "Yeah, I'll do it." Yeah. Um, I've learned. Don't <laughs> book one the next day. But anyway, that must have been stressful. Did you get back in time? Did you get back? Oh, I'll, li I'll listen to this now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was at the wedding. I must have been, about, I was flying about 1 a.m. in the morning home. Uh, um, so I just thought I'm going to have to suck it up. I was going to do a bit of the dancing because it was at their house, their private house in Marbella. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful sunset. I was like, oh, this couldn't have gone any better. Say goodbye to the couple. Oh, all right. Let's take the car back to the. Uh, uh, the the car hire in the airport, mm. so you know it's like you got to fill it up first, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm in good time now to get in there for the airport. So I get to the uh, petrol station about a mile away, um, fill it up, go to get my wallet out of the car. Lost my wallet. Oh, Where's my no, wallet? No. Oh, oh Jesus, Jesus! I got nothing to pay with this. Oh, like oh my God, I, I don't speak Spanish, right? <laughs> I can't even speak Welsh. <laughs> I love Spanish. So I goes in the petrol station. Oh, I'm really sorry. I, I I have no money. She's like, you you can't fill up then. I was like, no, I have filled up. <laughs> oh, no. I can't pay for it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'd like, be so scared. I had, fill, I had to fill out all these forms. Oh. But first of all, the person come and looked in the car for the wallet. Just couldn't find it with me. Yeah. Like, Shit, I've got to get this to the bloody. So I'm starting to like, you know, I missed the laid back on most things, but I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna miss this bloody wedding the next day now. Yeah. Miss the thing. So <clears throat> I had to fill in these forms. I'm like, oh god. So I put in the sat nav to the airport because I'm like, I'm literally within the vicinity of it, like a mile away. So I, I followed the sat nav to the air what I thought was the airport, and I ended up in some industrial bit. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, so I, I, I typed it in again. I literally did a loop to loop and ended it back up in almost the same place, but the other side. I was like, oh my God. I'm starting to panic a little bit now. Oh, so I was like, oh my God, my sat nav isn't taking me there. So I switched on my data roaming on my phone, mm. managed to get to the airport, and I'm. Mm. My plane is going in less than an hour now, and I haven't done any of the of the, the rigma. <clears throat> so I get to the multi story car park where the uh the car rental is and um, all the barriers are down apart from this one level and my car rental is on a different floor and they tell you to park it in on that floor and take a pick uh, and say like 7a kind of thing uh -huh, yeah so i took it in i was like oh my god i can't get on the floor i need to i'm just gonna have to run down and tell them give them the keys and go oh this is on the other floor <laughs> I, I run down i said oh look i can't 
get in and I had no money to get to pay to get through the barriers and stuff. I thought, oh my God, what's going on? Oh my God. My flight is in 30 minutes. <laughs> so, so literally, I, 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 they say, no, 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 you need to bring it to this floor. So I tried again. I tried going through a barrier the wrong way and everything and just oh. didn't work. So in the end, I just parked it up, took a picture and uh, I just ran down and I threw the keys at them and I said, <laughs> it's a 7A. And they're like, no, 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 no. I was like, I'm going. I'm going <laughs> so I had my camera gear and all that on my back. I had to run like a mile. Oh. I literally, they'd close the gates, the, the door. I'd run all the way through the airport. I was piping the sweat. So got got to the gate. It was closed, right? I said, I said, oh, please, please, please. I got to get back. I got to get back. She's like, oh, all right. It hasn't left yet. And luckily they let me in. The plane was full and they were all just looking at me. This <laughs> that guy, you're that sweaty, guy. Yeah, the sweaty mess who'd been running a mile. Like, I thought it was having a heart attack. Oh, man. And then there was this old couple next to me who just looked like, oh, my God, who is this nut job, you know? <laughs> and, and then my, my concern was I was flying to Bristol. I had to get over the Severn Bridge to get to stay at mum and dad's tonight. I can go to the Gower to do the wedding the next day. And I'm like, oh, my God, I've got no money to go over the bridge. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to Cheltenham. Like, and then, like, literally have an hour's sleep, get money, and drive down to Wales. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the end of the world. So I asked the guy next to me. I was like, oh, dude, I'm really... I didn't say dude because he's older than me. That's like, it's not cool, right? I said, yeah. Excuse yeah. me, sir. <laughs> Please, sir. Um, I don't I can have some money, up. sir. <laughs> yeah. I, it's not something I usually do. This random sweaty <laughs> guy has just come on the plane is now like asking for money. <laughs> yeah. So you can see his wife kind of like nudging him, going, like, don't, 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 don't associate yourself with that. Like, no, like, kind of thing. So I was just like, all right. And I was trying to show him, like, Instagram and that just to prove I'm a wedding photographer. I just gave him this sob story to get over the Seven Bridge. And anyway, I was like, oh, look, don't worry about it. Because I could see the wife getting a bit, like, you know. So I was like, oh, it's okay. Don't worry. So I, I nodded off, right? I fell asleep. He tapped me on the shoulder when his wife had fallen asleep. Because oh. <laughs> he obviously felt sorry for me, but oh. <laughs> didn't want to upset his wife. He tapped me on the shoulder and gave me, like, £3.50. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Oh. Yeah. He said, that's all I've got. I'm sorry. And I was oh. like, the bridge is £5.50. <laughs> <laughs> I was still £2 down. <laughs> so so I, had to, I had to drive back to Cheltenham. Hour and hours kept drive all the way down to this wedding. Just do it. Suck it up and just, yeah. Oh, so, my days. What a story, man. That is the <laughs> awesome story. I love it. Funny now, but at the time. Jesus. <laughs> The fab Dan Morris there with an absolutely brilliant story. I love that. What a nightmare, but what a story. Awesome. Um, so yeah, if you just head to thisreptage.com or thisreptagefamily.com and find this 100th episode page on there, you can just enter his name in the form. His name is the answer. And you'll be in with a chance of winning a This Reptage or This Reptage Family membership. Or if you're an existing member, an extra 12 months on your membership. Um. Something else that I really love about the podcast is the community aspect of it. Um, I mean, we have our Disruptors, Disruptors family meetups and our Christmas party and it's ace. It's so great to meet people in the flesh. But I love the fact that with the podcast as well, um, you know, I'm talking to new people week in, week out. I love the fact that they're being heard by hundreds of other photographers all around the world. I, I, I just love that. I think it's so cool. When a lot of the time, you know, we just have our interactions a lot of the time in life just via social media, via little profile pics and we, we don't even know what people sound like a lot of the time i know you guys if you have listened to a lot of episodes you're probably sick of my voice but so and i apologize for that but um i hope you enjoy hearing other voices every week and i i, I know i i really do um and talking about community and and ha how good it is here's uh, the fab sana de block who was our storyteller of the year in 2020 from episode four talking about community as well i really think part of it is is the community I think if you if you work together and it's not a battle, we just we lift each other higher and by talking to each other and doing things together and um, asking opinions. I share an office with uh, Joshua Dont. Oh, cool. Um, um, so normally we sit here side by side and then sometimes I'm like, what should I do with this picture? Should I include it in the uh, reportage or not? And then uh, we help each other out this way. Sometimes you have to kill your dog, darlings, and it's, <laughs> it's you know that your friends. For me, they're not colleagues; they're my friends, um, because I know I can count on them no matter what. 
We're towards the end now of this special 100th episode. Um, I, I still find that very surreal to say 100th. It's so weird that we've got to 100 episodes. Honestly, it feels like we've done like 10 or 12. It's really, really surreal for me. But anyway, yeah, I, I hope you've en enjoyed this this little look back. Um, we've still got some time for some more clips. And I just wanted to show some more examples of photographers just being so insightful and sharing just such great experience and bits of knowledge. And we can all just learn so much from them. Honestly, I just find it amazing. Thank you everyone that I've spoken to for being so open and sharing. And thank you for listening, it's, um, it's awesome. Um, here's Steve Gerrard from episode 25 talking about shooting what he loves. Somebody mentioned to me, like on one of my courses that I was doing, um, they said you should bring some of what you do in your music photography, and that included not just concerts but like band portraits and things like that. But you should bring some of that into your wedding work. And back then, I couldn't see how those two things um, related to each other at all, and couldn't see what I could bring from music photography into weddings. But then it kind of made me think, well, maybe I should just do make make try and make wedding pictures that i really like rather than trying to make wedding pictures that i think couples were like the very lovely pedro Villela from episode seven shared about the little stories within the big story and that's uh, the things that i love to see on on uh reportage pictures you know small moments small details small uh, stories uh, inside the big story uh, sure. because there is always uh, a bigger story than the wedding itself you know there's always uh, uh, the grandmother the uh, the the friend that uh, arranged the, the meeting between the couple uh, you know there are lots of things to to find in the wedding day that can be interesting or more interesting than the wedding itself in episode 35, the fab Ruin Redling High spoke about turning your weaknesses into strengths. That's been helpful in, in the way that I shoot. If, if there's something that's not working, to sit down and figure out how do I make it better? How do I, how do I change my technique, my approach? Is it my personality when, when, in, when I arrive? What, what is it that's not making it work? And, and work on that to make it better. And make it a strong point. Change it from what's not your strongest point is something that you excel and and mm -hmm. and relish to do the fab kim hart photography from episode 34 and the lovely couple menino conyes menina from episode 38 both spoke about shooting from the heart all the things that you're not good at learn them and then let it go and then when you are at a wedding just use your intuition your your feelings follow your heart and your soul and capture those moments because you can feel them. So forget about everything. Just get behind your, comp yeah, your, your camera and just follow the emotions and the energy that are all around you. Come close. Yeah, well, after Corona, or <laughs> just, just come close. If, the more you feel it, the closer you have to come. Just be there. The way that you keep these things consistent, I think it's thinking with your heart. If if you think, if you if you lift up the, the, the camera, it shoot because something inside you moves you to shoot that photo. Uh, you don't have to to worry with consistency because everything is consistent with your personality, with yourself. With yourself. Yeah. So you are the reference for the consistency of your work. Priscilla Luca from episode 41 had these fab words to say about experimentation. Don't try to focus on developing a style for yourself. Just experiment with different things, try new things. And, you know, eventually you will, you'll reach that. You'll, you'll be able, you'll figure out what it is that you like to do and what you don't. But unless you don't try different things, you'll, you'll just be in a constant search for style when, you know, maybe what you're trying to do at that moment isn't what you actually would do. Okay, wait, I think I've just made it so wordy and it's not... Really <laughs> 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 oh, made it so wordy. No, what you said there was so good. That is so true. And it's not just photography, advice and tips and insights that my guests share, though. So much of what they talk about is their own life experience, life tips, you know, life advice, which is 
at the end of the day, far more important than photography, really. And I, I love that that's a big, big focus, pun intended, there, of the podcast. Uh, here's Peter Hellock from episode 28 with some great life advice. At some point, we were talking about this and we figured, OK, do we want to keep working just to pay the mortgage for this ridiculous house? Mm -hmm. Or do we want to live? And then we decided we want to live and enjoy ourselves and uh, enjoy time with our kids. We gave away a lot of stuff. We sold a lot of stuff. We threw away a lot of stuff. And yeah, well. it's simplifying again, man. It's, uh, I, can, I can really recommend it to everybody. You've been listening to the 100th episode of the This Is Reportage podcast. I hope you enjoyed this revisit to some past episodes. And if you'd never listened before, I hope you'll enjoy going through our back catalogue and hopefully tuning into future episodes as well. You can head to thisreportage.com or thisreportagefamily.com to see the specific awards that Gretchen Yost and Sam Docker mention in their clips too. Good luck if you're entering our contest to win one of 10 memberships and note that the deadline to enter is 2359 GMT on 20th of January 2022. If you're not a member of this reportage or this reportage family, check out all the benefits of joining us, including an unlimited number of images on your profile, 60 individual award and 18 story award entries per year, invites to our physical meetups and parties, exclusive discounts, hours of educational videos featuring tips and advice from some of the world's best photographers, and much more. Entries are now open for our first award collections of 2022, where it's the start of an all-new awards year. The deadline is the same for both our wedding site and our family site. Submit by 2359 GMT on 24th of January 2022. No poses, nothing staged. This is Reportage. And this is bye for now.